Hello, it's Keith here, and this is lesson 18 of the platform specific series of my 6502 assembly programming tutorials. Now, we looked last week at the BBC, we're going to be looking this week at palette definitions on the Atari 800 and 5200. Now, if you didn't catch last week's lesson, we're going to be looking at using a common format for all of our systems, and then we're going to convert that format to whatever the hardware can actually do, because this is a much easier way of us working with a lot of different systems. We don't want to have to work out what colors are the equivalents of the ones we ideally want to use for each system. Let's get the code to do that for us. So the way we're doing things within these tutorials is based on the CPC+. We use one nibble per color channel. That's a good approximate for whatever a lot of our systems can do. Some can do a lot less, a few can do a little bit more, but it's close enough that it gives us a nice palette range and doesn't waste too much memory in our palette definitions. Now on the Atari 800 and 5200, we have quite an odd palette. It's a kind of an NTSA trick, I believe. It's sort of this, you have this effectively a rainbow and you have a brightness, but we don't really have the, the kind of definition we'd probably want for our colors. And it's very similar to the Nintendo NES in that case. Now, when it comes to setting the colors in the mode we're gonna be using, we have up to four colors. So we have a background color, a color zero, one, and two. And we can set these with memory addresses, either C016 or D016, just depending on the Atari 800 or 5200. And we just use six, seven, 18 and 1A, unfortunately not really very consecutive there, we'll see that in the code, but effectively we just write a hexadecimal value to those addresses, and you can see here that the top nibble is effectively the colour within this rainbow, and the bottom nib nibble is effectively the brightness. Now how are we going to do things with our RGB colour definitions, because they aren't going to map very easily? Well what we're going to do is we're going to use a lookup table, we're going to use a 3 times three times three lookup table, so effectively nine entries in total. And on this plane, we're going to be using the blue, this plane is going to be the red, and then this plane is going to be the green. And so we've got three times three times three for red, green, and blue, which is going to give us our effective colors. Now, when it comes to the colors that we're going to convert to, we're going to have a bit of a choice, and you may not like the colors I've chosen. And of course, if that's the case, you're welcome to swap out the lookup table for whatever you feel suits you. But I needed to come up with something as a quick approximation so my code would work, and that's what I've done here. So let's see what's actually going to happen to today's example. Now we've seen it before, but actually it may have changed very slightly because I have changed the code a little bit. So here's our Chibi Code character here, looking rather small. Can we make this any bigger? No, I don't think we can. Well, let's try the Atari 800 version instead. Maybe we can see that a bit more clearly. There we go, there's Chibi Code. So we've got purple hair, we've got this kind of blue shoes, and we've got white face, which is approximately right. Now, usually the purple hair would be a little more, little bit more of maybe a reddy purple and it'd be a little bit darker and the um, sign would be usually be a little bit brighter but that's pretty close I mean it looks perfectly nice so I'm quite happy with that now one interesting thing to notice is the colors may not be correct on a um, depending if you swap between PAL and NTSC systems so again you might want to have an alternate color palette if the one I'm showing you here doesn't work quite right on your system but as I say it's a good starting point and it's not going to be too much work for you to swap out the colors if you're not happy with the choices I've made here so how does this code actually work? Well, it's very straightforward. Well, we've got a palette definition here. We've actually got 16 palette entries because it's so generic, I'm not bothering to cut it down for the four color and the 16 color systems. Of course I could if memory was a constraint, but this is a very simple example, so I'm not being particularly restrictive there. So we've got a palette definition here. As you can see, one nibble per channel, green, red, and then blue. So here is our black here with all three being zero. This is purple, um, a moderate amount of red and blue. This is cyan, a lot of green, a lot of blue, no red, and white is, of course, maximum red, green, and blue. So that's our color definition here. And when it comes to actually using them, what we've got is we've got this set palette command. All we do is we set the zero page entries H and L, which we're loading in just here, and we're loading them from this palette definition here, which we're storing temporarily in DE in the zero page. And then what we're doing is we're setting the accumulator to a number from zero to three, which is the palette entry we want to change. And then we're calling this set palette command. And this is of course all based on my original Z80 tutorials. We had the same command, which worked in the same way. That In that system though, of course, there are an actual Z80 H and L register, which is why we're mimicking them just here. And of course, here's the set palette command that's actually doing the work. Now we're doing a conversion here and we're using this palette map just here, which is an effectively which is effectively the data just here 
invite format for us to look up into. And what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to convert those one nibble per channel red, green and blue entries into a zero to two for the X axis, a zero to two for the Y axis for the red values, and then a zero to two for the jumps down to these alternate tables here. And then we're going to need to multiply the red by three because there's three entries in each line and we need to move down a line for red. And then we're going to need to multiply green by nine because there's nine entries in each of these tables. And we're going to need to move down a table as the green entries go up. And then finally, we just need to add the blue. That's how we're going to look up our entries in the lookup table. So how do we do things? Well, first we want to check if we've got a value that's too high. As you saw, my example code today is actually trying to send 16 entries but the Atari 5200 and 800 can only take four. So that's not going to go very well. So if we've got too high a value, we just jump to the abort down here and we just return. Now what we need to do is we need to back up the palette entry we want to change because first of all, we need to work out the offset within that table. And what we're doing here is we're using this palette convert command. And what this is doing is it's taking the top nibble of the entry and it's comparing it and it's converting it to either a zero, a one or a two, depending on how it meets these criteria. So we're converting it with some ranges and we're saying it's either a zero or one or two, depending on how it fits within those ranges. So that's how we convert the first value here. And we're converting the red entry, which is this top nibble here of the ZL byte. And so we've done that and we store it temporary in B. Now we need to do the second part of ZL, which is the blue byte, the low byte. And we use this alternate version power convert R and this just swaps the nibbles around and then uses the exact same code to convert again. We now we no longer need our L value because we've done red and blue that were in it. So we just store that back into L and then we do the same for the green value. Again, the bottom nibble here and we're just storing that in ZH. We've now got the red value in ZB, the blue value in ZL and the green value in ZH. And these are all zero, one or two. So they're now within our ranges. What we now need to do is we need to multiply them up we need to multiply that green value by nine. So what we're doing is we've still got it in the accumulator. So we just rotate it left, doubling it. Then we do rotate it left again, quadrupling it. Rotate it left again, it's now multiplied by eight. And then we add the original ZH and that has effectively multiplied it by nine. So now the accumulator stores green times nine. We then add the red value, which is in ZB three times. We've effectively added red times three. And then we add the blue value and we've now got the offset that we need within that table. So we store that in Y, load in our palette map address, which is of course just this here. And then we read in from that lookup just here. So we've now got in the accumulator, the new color for the palette entry we want to change. Well, what do we need to do next? Well, we need to decide what an entry within the GTIA addresses we actually want to write to. Now, this is a little bit tricky because of course they do change depending on the system on the Atari 800, they are D016, D017, D018, and D01A. Now, this is effectively the background color here. So, this is color one, two, and three in the way we are considering them for our other systems. So, the addresses are slightly different on the Atari 5200, but we're using this GTIA offset to define it. So, as long as this GTIA is defined in our headers, so we don't need to worry about that. What we do need to worry about is that if we are using the background color zero, we want to use address 1A, otherwise we want to use 6, 7 or 8. What we're doing is we're setting GTIA start to the first color, D016 here, but then we are setting Y to 4, which is effectively pointing to D01A here. Then we load in X from our ZAS here. ZAS, of course, we've backed up at the start, so that's the color. If this is zero, we then jump to palette found because we've now decided the color that we want to change. So if we actually jump to here, then Y would point to four and then offset it to GTIA start. This would effectively be the pointing to background color zero. What we do next though, if we've not done that, we now set Y to zero. Resetting this offset, we're now pointing to DO16. And then we loop around here, repeating, repeatedly decrementing X, which is of course our palette entry we want to change and incrementing Y until we get the color that we actually want. When we get to here then, whatever happens, Y offset from that GTIA start will now be the correct palette entry for the color we want to change. So we just then store that and that will then write to the GTIA and that will set the color. That's all we need to do. It's a bit of a pain because of this weird numbering system. It would have been nicer if D015 was the background or something, but that's not the way it is. And this does a fairly effective job of setting the colors and it's relatively small. So it does the job well enough. 
So there we go. So that's how we can set the colors on the Atari 5200 and 800. We're going to be looking at more stuff on the Atari later on. We're going to be looking at the Atari Lynx as well later. So if you're an Atari fan, please stick around for that. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this lesson. Thanks for watching today and goodbye.